solving and estimating dynamic games of incomplete information. So uh, we can start with a, an example first and, and uh, try to introduce the, the key leading example of the, uh, that we're going to use throughout this lecture, uh, the dynamic exit entry model of Agirigabiri and Mira. Um, and and uh, and you know start with the stylized version of it, and then we're going to build up the entire uh, behavioral framework and give a, a, a introduction to dynamic discrete games. You know, introduce the notation and so on. So the the plan for today really follows uh, the pl a plan that was very similar to last time. So the focus here is on choice of estimator because we want to try to see if we can estimate these kind of models when you have microdata on on. Um, on, on discrete choices of entry and exit for, for, for firms, um, along with state variables such as like how many firms are active in the market and what is the market size and so on. Okay, so uh, it, so we're going to compare a variety of different estimators. We're going to look at MPAC. We're going to discuss just briefly what the what uh, the nested fixed point approach would would involve. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, implementations uh, or more sequential. A type of estimators like the nested pseudo likelihood, which is what Agirigabiri and Mira uh, develop in two thousand in the two thousand two paper for um, um, uh, for for single agent models, and now extend uh, to the case of uh, or of dynamic games in the two thousand seven uh, Eclametrica paper. Okay, so so we have already you know in in a previous lecture covered the two thousand two paper, so you know you should be you should just think of uh, you know this this current NPL as an extension to uh, what they, we did in the previous lecture. Very much the same idea, but just a generalization. And then likewise, the two-step estimators that we already talked about last time with in 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 uh, in our lecture on static games and and previously before that on single agent um, uh, dynamic uh, dynamic models. Um, how you could go out and estimate the choice probabilities and use that to really simplify the estimation uh, routine. Okay, so these are like models where you don't really have to solve uh, the, the the model, uh, like you wouldn't have to solve the dynamic programming model for single agent games, but 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 then you would, and here you wouldn't even have to solve the, the, the dynamic games. You just go out and estimate what the conditional choice probabilities are, and then stick them into the Bellman equation to do the Hotz Miller. So so that's kind of you know the. The, the various versions of how you can try to estimate uh, um, models. And, and all these methods have their pros and cons, and we're going to discuss what those are. Okay, and, and you know, I can reveal to begin with the, the MPEG and NFXP are kind of, um, they, are, they are full solution implementations of the maximum likelihood estimator, which is the most efficient thing you could do, but it's really computational. Uh, costly to do that, but then you have the the two step estimators on the other hand that may be uh, less efficient, but uh, in terms of statistical efficiency, but much more easy to impl implement and and faster to compute. Okay, so um, that's kind of the idea. So we, then after that um, discussion, um, we're gonna look at the empirical results for Giddy Gabiri and Mirror and um, discuss their findings in the. I, 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 the findings from, from the Cyclometrica paper where they're estimating this dynamic model of entry and exit um, for using data uh, for uh, oligopoly markets uh, in Chile from several uh, uh, retail industries like restaurants and gas stations, this kind of stuff. So they're comparing like five different markets. And, and then we're going to uh, try to see uh, what those data uh, implies it through the lens of the model in terms of what the you know, fixed cost or uh, um, fixed cost and uh, entry cost and strategic interactions are uh, relative to uh, the the uh, amount of profits uh, and, and how that varies across different markets. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff that we're going to look at. Okay, and then uh, finally, uh, we're going to come back uh, to compare with how you can estimate the same model um, and, and study the, the prop properties of the these different estimators in a Monte Carlo exercise done by by East Alliance. I mean, there's also uh, lots of Mon Monte Carlo uh, um, experiment uh, evidence in Agirigabiri and Mirror that's very ex ex exciting, but uh, doesn't have uh, NP um, doesn't have impact. So we will take take the results from there, and and, and also it kind of um, it discusses some of the recent 
um, issues that have been raised with with impact for certain classes of games uh, uh, where you have instability of the NPL mapping. Anyway, so so here's here's a game we're looking at. Okay, so just an illustrating sample. We have like five firms, so we index firms by i. Uh, so in this case, i go from one up to to n, which is equal to five. Okay, and then firm each firm they may at a discrete choice every period whether or not to be active in the market. Okay, so if you're active in the market, then a uh, i t is equal to one. Okay, so t for being active in the market per period t, and then i for player i, and then a that's the action. Okay, and that could be either one if you're active or enter, or zero if you're inactive or 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 exit. Okay, so these are the choices. Okay, and then at the same time, it's also really a state. Okay, because you know if you're in the in the previous period, you were active and you choose to be active in the market, then you're going to be there, and uh, potentially. That can be if there's entry cost, that will be a relevant state state variable in this model. Anyway, so we'll come back to that and specify the model later. I just wanted to to you know just get a picture of that. There's more than one firm here making decisions, and and some various state variables are are moving uh, forward. Okay, so firms here make simultaneous choices. Okay, so the, the, they all look at the state variables. Um, uh, that are uh, some state variables are like common knowledge, so everybody observe the realization of that state variable uh, before making the decision. In this case, that that would be the the market the market size, right? That's that's common knowledge. It's also common knowledge how many firms were active in the market in the previous period, right? So you, when you go to the next period and you observe what the the market size is, all the firms knew how many firms were active in the market last period. So this is potentially another state variable. Now this can also be idiosyncratic shocks to investments. So we're going to treat those as private shocks, just like we did in the last period in the in the in the last lecture in static games. So the information structure is very much the same there. Like we have the ID extreme value shocks that will be unobserved for 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 the uh, for the other firms, and uh, but but uh, you but the decision maker will observe their own idiosyncratic shock to investment before making the decision, and the econometrician doesn't observe that at all. Okay, but observe the common shocks. Okay. So, so we're going to use that that similar structure here. Now, okay. So, so they, you know, given given the state, which would be say uh, the um, how many say for example, or, or which of the firms were active in the market last period, um, combined with with, with this the, the market size, then they make the this decisions, and, and 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 so the firms here when they make that decision, they take expectations over what those private ID extreme value shocks are for all the other firms. And then they make a simultaneous decision all at once. Okay, so it's a simultaneous choice. Sometimes you can model uh, games with alternating moves, and this is not the case here. So we're going to look at actually alternating move uh, model and alternating move uh, model and next time in a case of a leapfrogging model where firms make alternate alternate in terms of when they making making their decisions. Okay. Um, but not here. So we're going to look at simultaneous moves. Okay, and then the, the game moves on. We go to the next period to market size reveals and it, it's increasing. And then firms make their decisions and more firms are entering and and, and, and so on and so forth. Now, one of the things I've, I've kind of, you know, this then the games go on. Now, one of the things you can see here is, say, when this firm two is just making the same choice every period. Okay, and and once uh, firm one is, is, is entering, it's also like making... Uh, staying inside, uh, staying in the, the the game. It's not like they're flipping. The, those choices are completely new every period. Um, so there's persistence in those choices. In order to really model those, get that persistent model, well, we need we need a dynamic model um, where the firms are uh, potentially take into account uh, entry cost. Okay, so if there's entry cost, it's going to generate. That type of persistence. Okay, so that's going to be that in Gregory and Mira's uh, model, and they're trying to estimate what those entry costs are. Okay, um, and then of course, if there's like big cost or or, an, or low profits of being associated being in the market, then there's uh, going to be uh, less firms in the market, and so on. Okay, so anyway, so th this is kind of the, the idea. The firms are looking at the other firms, making decisions, and being forward looking. And, and, and an example of, of, of that is uh, 
um, taking into account that if you enter today, then you 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 you, you um, make a decision on um, also thinking about whether being there tomorrow, so you don't repeatedly pay these fixed cost of entry. So let's move on. So we want to try to see if we can uh, estimate uh, models uh, of this kind of dynamic discrete choices. So um, so here's an example. Of maximum. Uh, there's several different ways of, of doing this. It's like a maximum likelihood uh, type uh, uh, full solution methods, uh, the maximum likelihood estimator, or we can use two-step estimators like we have talked about previously or, in, or on the nested pseudo likelihood NPL estimator. Okay. So, um, so this is like I'm now the third time I'm, I'm, I'm repeating this. Um, first, it was for the case of single agent dynamic models, and last time it was for the um, um, it was for static games uh, of incomplete information, uh, where we also covered all these different methods. Okay, so we're gonna do that now, but now for the like full nine, nine yards with with uh, dynamic games. Okay, so so th many of the conclusions are the same. Okay, maximum likelihood is just the most efficient thing you can do. Uh, but it's because it's in it's it's in, it's building on the entire model structure, and deriving the sample criterion based on uh, all <clears throat> all the moments that the model are making predictions about the entire distribution of uh, the discrete choices conditional on the states and 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 the state evolution and so on. Okay, so it's like the most efficient thing you can do, but it's just very expensive to compute because you need to solve the um, uh, solve the, the, the dynamic model, okay? At least you need to solve it once at the true parameters because otherwise you wouldn't be able to figure out what the Lacroix function is at that point. Okay, and now we already know about the the curse of dimensionality. Um, so as the number of state variables increase, then the computational complexity uh, increase exponentially in the number of state variables. So we already, you know, we, we know that very well. But there's also a curse of dimensionality in the number of players and, 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 and so um, now you don't have one value function, you have a value function for each player and you have a set of choice problems for each player, okay? And then the, the uh, so, so it's just much, it's, it's much higher dimensional if you want to solve that. Okay, so uh, NFXP, well, <clears throat> that would suggest that you're repeatedly solving this model over and over again. Every time you make a, um, you evaluate the sample criterion that you're using uh, in, in the estimation, like, like the likelihood function or GMM criterion or whatever, okay? That requires you to solve the model so you, you can uh, use the behavioral rules to um, de develop the, the likelihood function, okay? You need to do that as you search over the parameter space. Now, for single agent models, well, that's already pretty complicated, but here you need to solve for all the marker perfect equilibria, okay? So that is, if it says, Potential multiple multiple equilibria. You need to find all of them. Okay, so you need to find the optimal behavior in all the different equilibria for all the different players of the game. Okay, so that's uh, you know breathtaking uh, hard. Okay, so then then is the alliance so what they propose is to use a constraint optimization approach, um, and, and and they do a, a constraint optimization formulation for the maximum likelihood estimator to estimate dynamic games. So this is just an extension of what we looked last time where uh, Su, or Chin and Su had uh, um, developed it for the, uh, the, for the static example. And, um, and here uh, in this paper, they developed it for the dynamic model. Okay. So very cool. Um, and, and, and then make some other color. So we're gonna look at that. And then we're gonna defer to next time the full solution approach um, because we don't really have a good solution algorithm for the case of, uh, of uh, dynamic games with multiple equilibria because we can't do the successive approximation um, of uh, solving uh, lots of Bellman equation system play systems of player player Bellman equations um, if there's multiple equilibria so we need another algorithm like a full solution algorithm that can trace out all Marco perfect equilibria and there exist some algorithms to do that for example this, this all solution homotopy uh, method um, we may discuss that a little bit next time, and then uh, and, and, and a full solution algorithm um, um, called the recursive lexicographical search algorithm that can it's proven to to 
find all macroperfect equilibria of a, a specific class of dynamic game. So we're going to look at that next time. Okay. So 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 not for today. Okay. And um, then uh, two-step estimators. Well, they're they're computationally simple, but uh, potentially there's a large finite sample biases. We're going to present some Miranda Carlo in the in the end that, that kind of illustrate that. And then the nested pseudo likelihood NPL estimator. Um, developed by uh, Agira Gabiria and Mura in, in, in the very end of it in, in Katsuhara and Shimatsu, also a kind of metric, huh? in, in 2012. Um, the idea here is that, that this should potentially bridge the gap between um, um, between the, 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 the highly efficient uh, um, but very expensive to compute maximum likelihood estimators and then the less efficient but hard uh, but computational simple two-step estimators by is sequentially updating. It turns out, just like we kind of indicated with the static sample last time, that this NPL mapping can be unstable, and 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 we'll illustrate that here. Uh, that's also the case for dynamic games. So I know that Victor is working on you know stabilizing that algorithm and solving it instead of solving it with successive approximation, solving it with a more Newton type of algorithm, and that has actually some very promising. Uh, turns out to have some very promising results. In, in a way, it's a little bit simple, similar to uh, inheriting some of the uh, properties that MPEG has. Anyway, so this is kind of like a very over broad overview of, of the literature of dynamic games, um, an incomplete overview. Um, so, so why don't we go to like the rope pan for, for the rest of this lecture. Okay, so first I'm going to look at just introduce the notation for the dynamic game in Akira Kibiri and Mirror 2007. Talk about the state variables, the player's utility, utility maximization problem, and the introduced equilibrium concept was going to be macro perfect equilibrium. Um, and and um, then uh, to show the Bellman equation and talk about Bellman optimality uh, implied by. Uh, 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 the, the, the model, um, and then the Bayesian Nash equilibrium conditions that also need to be satisfied in, in, in order to achieve the micro perfect equilibrium. Um, and, um, and then how to solve for the micro perfect equilibrium. And, and then we, then we'll go to, 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 to talk about the, um, M, the, the various different uh, estimation methods, MPEG, NFXP, NPL, two-step estimators, once we have developed all this machinery and we can be a little bit more formal than so far. Okay, so then the Monte Carlo uh, results from ESD Alliance Sioux. Actually, I'm going to end with that and then first present the results from, from uh, Agiri Gabiri and Miro just before that. So 9 and 10 will be properly switched. Okay, anyway, so you've probably forgotten that about that when, when I come to that. All right, so here's a notation for the dynamic game in, in Agiri Gabiri and Mira in 2007. Okay, so we got discrete time, infinite horizon, so t, t goes from one up to infinity, and we got n players indexed by i, um, and, and so here's a set of players, it's just, you know, the index one up to, uh, to, 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 to cabal n, and then we can have uh, a, um, varying uh, the, the number of pot potential players, okay? Um, then the market is uh, character, and so, so n here is the number of potential entrants, okay? So it's not like, uh, um, so it's not like, it's not the number of firms that are active in the market, it's number of potential active firms, okay? Okay, so the market is characterized by size. Okay, so this is a com common state variable S, just like we indicated in the beginning, which can take values S up to to capital uh, to to S L. Okay, now we we may actually just discretize that so and then evaluate. So you know, just think of them as values one up to L. Okay, um, market size is observed by all players, um, and and so it's it's a um, it's a common knowledge variable. And then there is, um, uh, and that's following an exogenous and stationary market size transition. Okay, so notice here, this is completely exogenous. Okay, so market size is just something that goes on. It doesn't have to be that way with state variables, but this state variable does. So this is a very simple one. Okay, so it's not affected by the choice of the players at all. So like examples of other uh, other state variables in you know in other models. Uh, would not be like that. Like, like for instance, if you have technology in, F or be the current uh, implementation of technology, 
um, of, 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 the fir of a firm in a model with R&D investments, right? Then their R&D is going to be affecting uh, the transition for, for uh, the, the technology for the firm, right? Um, and, and so it would be depend on the action, right? which if the R&D is the action. But this is very simple. Market size just you know goes on. It's just a population growth in in uh, in the in this in this in this economy. Okay, um, and then in the beginning of each period, t and then for each player observes x. Okay, which are like the observed state variables. So we're going to use the same idea uh, in distinct distinction of, of of state variables x and and epsilon as we had last time. Uh, where, where X is those that are observed by the contrition and epsilon are those that are not observed. But here, um, uh, these common knowledge, um, uh, these X's are common knowledge, so they're observed by all the firms, and epsilons are private knowledge, so they're firms, they are only observed uh, um, by the, the firms making the decision. And, and then also, uh, this is not observed by, by the contrition, okay, when we're doing. Uh, trying to estimate the model, but that's kind of late. Um, and then they simultaneously uh, make choices, just like we outlined in the, in, in the beginning, whether or not to be active in the market in that period. And then, and, and so here's a little bit of notation for, for, for that choice. So let uh, AIT be the indicator for, uh, uh, with the binary indicator, 0 or 1, whether fir firm I is active in period T, okay? Just like uh, we had um, in the first in the first couple of slides, okay. And then AT that's a collection of all players' actions. And then AT minus I that's a collection of current actions for all the players other than um, uh, other than firm I. Okay, so this is for all fir firms, but this is for all firms except firm I. I mean, this is the standard notation, and it's kind of you know good to get this in place. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the state variables here. Okay, so the the, the state the, the the common state common knowledge state variables in this case is going to be the, the market size. Okay, but it's also going to be the lacked the vector of lacked uh, decisions. Okay, because who was active in the market last period? That's going to be observed by the agents. And so you wake up in the morning as a firm. You look out of the window, see how many customers are there, what's the market size, and how many else is, is joining me for the party, okay? And then you make your decision, okay? After receiving those epsilon shocks, okay? And then this epsilon i, well, that's a collection of epsilon shocks uh, over, for, for all the potential pot, potential decisions, which is going to A, that's going to just a binary, uh, the set of uh, zero on one. So, um, so there's a set of shocks for all the players, um, uh, for all the decisions, okay. So these, this is uh, we're going to take them as ID extreme value distributed across actions and players, as well as well as over time. Actually, in a Gideon Mirror and Mirror in the empirical application, they they actually work with normally distributed ver uh, errors and um, and and also some unobserved heterogeneity that's that's discretized uh, normal. Um, um, but um, yeah, that's kind of a that's kind of a detail. That you can work with a normal distribution with binary choices. Okay, if you have multiple normal choices, well, you're really pretty much stuck with the ID extreme value distri distribution, unless you want to try to see if you also can calculate the expected max and the uh, integral over all the the epsilons when you want to calculate the the choice probabilities. Anyway. That's a sidetrack. Okay, so the opposing players know only its probability density function of the epsilons, but and the realization of their own shock. Okay, then we can assume conditional independence. Okay, so so which in the form of this particular game, has takes this 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 form. Okay, so this is not the the exact formulation of conditional independence, but it's highlighting that in the model we're thinking of here, the the uh, the, the, the unobserved state variables are conditionally independent. Uh, uh, or, or, so they're independent conditional on uh, the, the epsilon shocks. Okay? So there's, there's like, like uh, we always have this, the, the distribution of the epsilons does not depend on the previous uh, epsilon. So this completely rules out serial dependence and also dependence across uh, 
the um, the different uh, shocks. Okay, then you have here this deterministic uh, transition of the state um, um, by by choice uh, with respect to the allocation of uh, of active firms in the market. Okay, so uh, in other words, if you come with with the with a, a number, this number of active firms today, then um, it's actually it's it's actually irrelevant for what the transition is because what the transition um, uh, to to next period state depend on is really only the choice that we also condition on. So so a, a here is actually irrelevant okay, in this case. So this deterministic transition by choice in this case. And then we have this, this market size variable that was completely exogenous. Now you can have games where you have another dependency structure, but this certainly lives up to the conditional dependence assumption on the state transition, on the control state transition. Okay, so let's move on and uh, talk about the player I's utility maximization problem. So now we have established what, you know, what the actions and states uh, are and what the state transition is. So we got theta here, uh, which is a, like a vector of structural parameters, and we're going to separate out beta here as a discount factor. Okay, uh, and this discount factor is going to be assumed to be the same for all the different players. Okay, it doesn't have to be that way, but th this is the case here. Okay, then player i's per period payoff function. Well, we got to have additive separability errors, so we're going to have state, um, uh, state and decision specific. Uh, payoffs pl uh, that depends on the the actions and the uh, and the common knowledge states, and then the idiosyncratic shocks to investments for firm I. Okay, so this is like you know just like we, we normally have I extreme value shock here. It can be I D extreme value and and, and uh, or it can have other distributions, but it's it's additive. Okay, and then the common knowledge component of the period payoff here. Well, you know, it depends on what is it that we have. It depends on the, um, on the, on X, which is what is X? That's both the market size and the lack decision, and then depends on the the actions. Okay, so in the following way. Okay, so so we're gonna think of firms that um, where where the 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 profits of the firm is going to be increasing in the size of the in, of the market. Okay, so if there's a lot of customers, big market, and and this is positive, then you're going to get higher profits if you are active in the market. Otherwise, if you're not active in the market, you, you're going to get zero. Actually, this normalization here is not an a, a, an innocuous assumption. It it uh, it it affects interpretation. Of uh, of the relevant state variable. So, it's, for instance, it's like exit um, cost of of exiting, right? Then that would actually be embedded in here, right? Um, uh, or, 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 or that would be that would that would also go into here. Okay, so so you have to think about that when you formulate the model. But anyway, we're gonna just assume that the that this is uh, uh, that the, that that if you're not in the market, you're just gonna get zero. Uh, Zero profits. Okay. Um, so and and then there is this particular part. This is what makes it a game, right? Because um, here is you, you're going to subtract um, theta r n um, from your revenue um, times log r one plus the number of firms. Are the number of other competitors. So essentially, just summing over the the indicator for so whether the other firms other than I are active in the market. Okay, so this is the number of firms active in the market. Okay, so if this is positive, well, then it's really like an uh, it's really like a, a anti coordination game. You want to want to be in the market as at the same time as as the other firms, and this makes the market more contestable. So if this is a really high variable, then you know, actually, you potentially could have multiple equilibria like we had last time. Okay. Then there is some fixed cost, and and actually here I think this is where Agita Gabiri and Mira they would make those uh, fixed cost. Um, uh, they would be market specific, but here in the uh, Monte Carlo experiments, they're going to be uh, player specific. Okay. Um, 
Um, so, so, so I've just you know used that since this, you know I'm trying to present two papers, but you know it, they're not fully identical. And then there is the uh, uh, the potential entry cost the firms have to play if they were not in the market in the last period. Okay, otherwise um, this is going to be be zero, right? I mean, if they're uh, if they were in the, in the market in the last, in last period, well then. Uh, this is going to be zero, and then you don't have to pay the entry cost. Okay, so you pay the entry cost when you're making an entry. Okay, so this is basically uh, the backbone of this dynamic game. It's the common knowledge component of the per period payoff function. So that's kind of established. And then what the firms are doing is they're maximizing uh, utility, uh, taking a sequence of actions from now on and into the future, um, and and then. Um, uh, by maximizing the expected discounted uh, um, uh, uh, pay payoffs, okay, um, and then taking expectations conditional on what the current value of the common knowledge state variables are. So that is again uh, market size and lack decisions for all the players, um, and then the private knowledge shock for the firm that they are looking at. So it's like. This is what you could solve by dynamic programming if you knew what the strategies for all the other players are. Okay, but we don't, so we need to, to um, for firms are making mutually uh, optimal responses, they're also making expectations about what the other firms are doing. So this is you know the whole idea with the game. Okay, so the equilibrium concept here is marker perfect equilibrium. So, um, and, and, and the equilibrium characterization is then in, term, in terms of the observed uh, payoff relevant states. So, uh, so, so and, and, and the equilibrium here is then a vector of, uh, of, of choice probabilities, or conditional choice probabilities and value functions um, that are mutually best responses, uh, constitute mutually best responses and, and Bellman optimality. Okay, so so here pi that's a conditional choice probability as usual, uh, and here the, we, we what we do is because we have several players we index them by uh, the, the conditional choice probabilities by by i. So there's going to be a set of choice probabilities for each player, and then um, so this is the uh, probability for player i taking on action a i in state x. Okay, and then v i v sub i. That's the expected value function, or actually the integrated value function for player i at state x. Okay, um, and then those two um, uh, can be stacked into uh, into to these objects, uh, you know, bold p and bold v, which is essentially the collection of all the conditional choice probabilities for all the players across all the actions. Uh, for all the all the states in the state space, okay, and similar for the value functions, we got um, the values for for all the uh, all the players and and for all, uh, all the state variables. So this is this is like just you know can repre be represented as a huge arrays or matrices if you have um, if you have finite states, okay, and finite decisions like we have here because it's discrete choice, finite number of players too, of course. And then the marker perfect equilibrium, well, that's the vector v and p that satisfies two system of nonlinear equations or two sets of constraints. Bellman optimality, so the Bellman equation needs to hold, and then Bayesian Nash equilibrium con uh, conditions. So the choice probabilities um, uh, for, for, a, 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 for a given player, well, that's the, um, uh, ec uh, that's the, the uh, choice probability is implied by um, uh, taking expectation uh, of the using the other players' expect uh, choice probabilities to form beliefs about what they are doing. Okay. Anyway, so first uh, Bellman optimality, and here is a version of so I've kind of you know maybe jumped a step here, um, but here's a, here's a version of the Bellman equation where you uh, you know taking the choice probability weighted uh, sum over all the alternatives, where where the basically the payoff here you got the the payoffs conditional on the choice, okay, and then you weight with the probability of the choice, just like we did when in the uh, when we developed the Hotzmiller inversion or the NPL and the NPL 
uh, algorithm uh, for single agent games, we, we also have this version of the um, where we uh, uh, represent the development equation um, uh, as a as a choice probability weighted sum of those uh, um, expected payoffs. Okay, conditional on those choices. So this here, well, what is that? That's I'm going to come back to it, but it's really the the conditional expectation of the epsilons given the uh, choice a i and the state x. Okay, so this is what is you know lock the Euler's constants minus log of the probability uh, of of, in, uh, of of choosing action uh, a i for player a, for player i, um, just like we 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 saw it last uh, for for a couple of times ago, and then there's going to be the future expected value, uh, but now here the the basically the the difference here is that now the control transition here does not only depend on the choice probabilities for for one player but for several players. So the, the, the agents are taking into account not only what I'm doing myself in the future, but also what are the other players doing in the future. So it's depending on the entire vector P that we defined here, so the entire collection P. Okay? And, and so um, that's Bellman optimality. And then let's just go into detail and look at all the different components. You got here you got the ex this is the expected payoff, player I from choosing action AI at state X and given the beliefs on the other players PJ, okay for all, for all the other players. Okay? And, 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 and so what is this? This is really um, this this sum over all the possible um, um, uh, the actions of, of the potential other players uh, taking <clears throat> the uh, uh, joint uh, problem, um, the, 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 the joint probability for, for this collection of players to making a particular sequence of choices. Okay? And then um, in here you got the, the, uh, um, the payoff that we just saw here, right? Um, the common knowledge component of the of the per period payoff, um, and then weighted with the probability that 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 outcome is taking place. Okay, which is what you have here. Like you have your uh, um, um, basically that joint probability here um, times uh, the the payoffs uh, for for that vector of actions. For all the other players than I. Okay. <laughs> so you know, you, this is a good mental exercise. Sit down, look at that equation. Uh, you know, um, take a cup of coffee and enjoy the beauty of it, and then you'll see that it actually makes sense. Okay. So I'm gonna not dwell more to it, but 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 uh, you know, it makes sense, right? You basically you're making taking the the. Basically, what it is is really the expected payer for player i from choosing uh, action i and uh, in in state x, given the beliefs, uh, forming beliefs given the uh, uh, the choice probabilities using the choice probabilities of all the other players. Okay. Okay. Now, so similar for for the state transition of uh, of the common knowledge state variables, given that set of beliefs, you can also form in the in the similar way, okay. So, um, so again, that choice probability, well, that would depend on the, so like the controlled or unconditional choice probability matrix for the state variables. Not only depends on your own cho uh, your own decision uh, a choice probability, but it as it would do in the Harold Sucker problem, right? Then you got the controlled transition matrix depending on the probability of whether you replace the engine or not, and then you multiply that with the Conditional um, uh, transition matrix, conditional on on, on the choice, um, and 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 so um, we have the same thing here, except that we are looking at what the joint probability of all the players are. Okay, and then the epsilons here. Well, we, we kind of already talked about this is conditional expectation on on the epsilon given the a is the optimal choice. Okay, and then if you had extreme value shocks, it's going to have this particular form, very very simple form. So this only this depends on the choice probabilities. So this is like the Bellman equation. Now um, that was the first set of uh, constraints. Okay, you need Bellman optimality to impose that agents are forward-looking. Okay. And this is all conditional on what those choice probabilities are. Okay, so this is like conditional 
on, on the beliefs about the optimal choice of the, all the other players. And then you need to also uh, ensure the spatial Nash equilibrium constraints or conditions where the choice probabilities are formed as the, um, uh, when you have the epsilon shocks, it's, it's um, the I at extreme value, you get the choice probabilities being, being uh, pure logit, uh, where the, um, what you have inside is the choice, uh, uh, choice specific expected value functions. Um, and again, here, what is, what is, what is that? Well, that is the, the uh, uh, expected payoffs like we just developed here. Uh, and then the discount uh, beta times the future expected value. Okay. Okay. So this is really just uh, um, uh, the yeah the choice specific value functions. Okay. The, except the, the 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 key difference here is now we're making exp expectations about not only what I, am I doing in the future, but what are all the other players doing in the future? Okay. So this is uh, the state transition. Uh, probability conditional on the current state and the other payers actions. Okay, we uh, we we have um, we 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 have that here. So this one here is is subscripted uh, i. So it's conditional on the action of player i. Okay, so this is a little bit different than we we the one we had here. This is conditional on a player i's action i and his beliefs about the other players, okay? So notice here that uh, this is uh, conditional on on AI being the optimal choice. So so it's, you got deterministic transition here of, of, of the state of firm I being active in the market, okay? And then you have stochastic transition about the uh, other firms. Okay. okay, so you have these two systems of equation system one and system two. Uh, so you need Bayesian Nash equilibrium and Bellman optimality, and and so I've just collected those two sets of equations here. So it's like a system of equations, right? Because uh, this is going to be an equation for each player and for each value of the state, and 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 here this is going to be uh, a choice probability for each player uh, for each action. So we here we have zero and one, and. In, but you get multiple choices, so there will be then there will be more, and then for each state. Okay, so you can see now this is already growing com compared to uh, what we normally have in in a single agent problem. Here, this the the the, the, the primitives are not the primitives, but the, but the solution to the model is increasing uh, with the number of players. Okay. So you got here in this compact notation first the Bellman optimality we call that phi uh, superscript v, and then um, P, uh, the, the Bayesian Nash equilibrium equ equation, we got that uh, phi superscript P, okay? Uh, that's a mapping from value functions and probabilities to value functions. You got the choice probabilities here, here, but you also got the value functions, okay? If you want to complete and combine those two, you're going to do the hotz miller inversion combined with um, the Bayesian Nash equilibrium, you can actually get a mapping from choice probabilities to choice probabilities, it turns out, right? Um, but we are not quite there yet. So then everything here would be embedded in the choice probability space. Then um, this gives then the, the set of all marker perfect equilibria, which is really the solution of um, uh, P and those P's and V's that satisfies those constraints. Okay. So we are, we are looking for uh, basically uh, the, the parameters that, that index that, okay. if we were to estimate the model. But 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 the solution here um, is going to be the, those uh, uh, p's and v's. Um, that's that's the equilibrium satisfied both sets of constraints. Okay, so um, when we start talking about s, before we start talking about estimators, we need to talk about how we think the data is, is generated for for to think about whether they, these potential can be consistent and you know unbiased and so on and what the properties of those estimators are. Okay, so we're gonna here start assuming uh, that there's existing a, a, a set of parameters, structural parameters, theta naught in the population, and at that set of parameters. Um, uh, there exists uh, 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 this tuple of choice probabilities and value function uh, choice uh, choice probabilities and value functions 
indexed at that set of parameters, which is the Markov perfect equilibrium at that set of parameters. Now that could that could be um, there could be multiple solutions to that for each state for each player. Okay, so in cases multiple equilibria, only one equilibrium we assume only one equilibrium is played in the data, like we like we did last time. We we started out working with equilibrium on one equilibrium played in the da data. We could also relax this assumption and work with only one equilibrium being played at each market, but that makes the the the, the size of the problem really grow hugely. Okay, uh, especially if you're looking at the uh, the impact formulation. But you know, um, we'll come back to that. So for now, just one equilibrium played in the data. Okay. The data consists on the observations of the actions uh, f uh, across uh, m different markets absorbed uh, t times, um, and then the common knowledge state variables. So in our case, it's common knowledge state variables is the market size and the lagged decisions or the lagged act activity status of the players. Okay, um, we assume those observations are independent uh, across markets and and over time periods. Okay, so. Um, and, and then in each market and, and time periods, researchers observe the common knowledge state variables and the player's actions. Okay, so the, we, particularly we do not do not observe the epsilon shocks. Okay, those those epsilons that also exist in the decision problem of the um, uh, utility maximization problem for for the players. Okay, those, those epsilons are unobserved. Okay, that's a that's a data that's a data generating process. And what and the and the observables. Now, given that we want to try to see if we can estimate the structural parameters, so think think about can we estimate theta naught? Okay. So for a given um, for a given theta, then let P L of theta and V L of theta denote a solution to uh, the L solution to the equilibrium. Okay, so there could be potential and multiple solutions to 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 the model um, implied by those uh, um, two sets of constraints here, okay? Um, Bellman optimality and Bayesian Nash equilibrium. There could be multiple solutions, okay? And sometimes it's one solution, sometimes it's multiple solutions. Uh, single agent models is most often the only one solution, and but here there could be multiple multiple equilibrium, which really complicates the solution. So how do we define the likelihood? Well, the likelihood. Well, that's uh, as given the data and 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 given uh, a set of parameters. Well, the log of the likelihood. Well, that's the same. That's the sum over. Um, that's the sum over um, all the all the different players, all the different markets, all the different time periods. The log of the probability uh, that player I is playing the observed action in market. M at time t, given the, the current state of the world, okay. Using the choice probability from the elf equilibrium, and then what we do here is that we max over all the different equilibria. So this is like we take the equilibrium that gives the highest likelihood. Now this is what we do need to do just to evaluate the log of the likelihood function, okay. And then the maximum likelihood estimator would be the argument that maximizes that uh, likelihood function, which is like the upper envelope of all the um, equilibrium specific choice, uh, equilibrium specific uh, likelihood uh, equi uh, likelihood uh, functions, if you will. Okay, um, you know, you take the max over all the solutions. So you both max with respect to the equilibrium selection out of those, those equilibria that could be, you know, existing in the model, but also the structural parameters. So what what does that? Uh, I mean, if if you're doing the nested fixed point approach, this requires the researcher to solve for all the marker perfect equilibrium, uh, all the marker perfect equilibria in order to do the maximization, right? For each trial value of the parameters. Okay. So if there's many equilibria. Well, you you would need a solution that can find all of them, okay? And this is what we'll talk about next time, uh, how you how you do that for a particular class of games. We're gonna skip it for now because right now we don't know any algorithm for solving 
all mock uh, all for all mock a perfect equilibrium. We could do it for the simple static game last time, where we could do a combination of bracketing uh, or bisection algorithm and successive approximation when we were just looking for three numbers. But here we're looking for like potential millions of equilibria. Okay, um, so we're gonna you know probably need some. Uh, 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 hard core algorithm to do that. Or we can try to, to see how far we can get with MPEG, which is actually quite appealing approach if you think about it. So given the data uh, set, um, again, you know, actions and comes, common knowledge state variables at all the markets, all the time periods, then we can work with a lot of some augmented likelihood function. Now notice here, here the log of this likelihood function, function is not a function of the parameters like we normally have, okay? It's a function of the player choice probabilities. So given the player choice probabilities, you can form what the likelihood is. Simply just, you know, summing, taking the, the average across all the different markets for, uh, for, for all the players, uh, some of all the players lock likelihood contributions, okay? And, uh, which is essentially just a log of the choice probabilities for all the players for, for their observed choices in, the, in each of the states. Okay. Now, <clears throat> but see, this guy here depends on, I mean, this depends on the structure parameters. This is what we want to find, but we want to, but it, it depends on it really in an implicit way, right? Because it depends on it through the, the constraints, okay? Okay, so we're gonna maximize this that doesn't, uh, uh, with respect to, um, to P, normally we would maximize with respect to, to theta only, but now also with respect to, to the choice problems and value functions. So whenever you wanna evaluate the, the the likelihood function is very easy uh, it, once you have already guessed on the vector of p, right? So, so, so no solution of equilibria here. Right? But then you're going to impose those constraints, and those constraints are essentially equations like the Bellman equation, the the sets of players Bellman equation, the Bayesian Nash equilibrium uh, equations. Okay. So, so see here, so there's a theorem in if they line Sue showing that. Um, both the constraint and the odd constraint pr uh, problems have the same solutions. Okay, so um, that's that's the MPEG approach here in terms of dynamic games. Okay, so the motivation here is um, <clears throat> uh, for MPEG is that you know it's been stated that the researchers using constraint optimization um, approach do not need to solve for all the equilibria at each gets of the structure parameter vector. Which is really a benefit because with NFXP you would need to do that and not only find one equilibrium but find all of them if there's multiple equilibria. Okay, what MPEG requires is that the constraints are satisfied, then that means the equilibrium is solved only at the solution at the maximum of the likelihood function, not at every iteration. Okay, so it's simultaneously searching for the structure parameters and for the Marco perfect equilibrium. Okay, of course, these two things have to be in accordance with each other at the solution, but these constraints does not need to necessarily hold for every trial value of thetas. Yeah, constraint optimization solver is trying to, you know, massage all this thing at once to, uh, you know, maximize the likelihood function. And then the constraint optimization approach only then needs to find those equilibria together with the structural parameters that are local solutions and satisfy the first order conditions um, uh, of the problem. And so these two features eliminate uh, a large set of equilibria together with structural parameters uh, or, or combinations that we would otherwise need to look at if we were doing NFXP. And, 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 and so um, this sounds very appealing. But it also, in some sense, sounds almost too good to be, be true. Um, and, and the question is, could anything go, go wrong? And, and we may want to, we, we, we can look a little bit of, at, the, at that last next time, but in cases where you really have a huge multiplicity of equilibria, it can be really, really hard to find the maximum of that uh, likelihood function where those constraints are satisfied, the global maximum. But the local maximum can be, you often end up in the local maximum. So you, 
you set you 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 where the set of constraints are satisfied. So you found an equilibrium, and you found a parameter that looks like a maximum. Uh, the, it like it maximizes a likelihood function, but how can you know if if that's uh, a, a, a local max or a, a global max? And and these uh, multiplicity of equilibria really creates a lot of local maxima. So you you often end up in the situ that, that situation. Anyway, apparently not in the in the A state line zoo in, in some, some simulation exercise. They, they don't seem to have much problems with that. But anyway, we'll zoom in on next time. We saw some of the problems arising in the static game example last time. And trust me, if you have huge multiplicity of equilibria, you're going to see that too in in. Um, um, in in, uh, in dynamic games with like uh, by orders of magnitude. Um, anyway, so so here's the two-step uh, method. The intuition for that um, is, you know, we are searching for p, but potentially p is observable, right? That is really just the distribution of the observable action. So we can observe that from the the data, the the choice probabilities. The choices are observed. Uh, in, in the data, so we can estimate p. So um, here is, is a constraint for um, uh, optimization formulation for the maximum likelihood estimate. It looks like this. You know, maximize uh, uh, theta, uh, p, and v. Uh, uh, the, the likelihood function is uh, with respect to, to structure parameters and the uh, p and v subject to these sets of constraints. Mm -hmm. And then to, to know the solution, uh, theta and then p star and v star. Okay. Now suppose we already know what p star is. How could we recover theta star, the the the, the true value of uh, theta, and then v star? Okay. How can you do that? If you, I mean, and, and this is not crazy to, to assume because we could potentially go out and estimate that. Okay. So what you could do is. Um, and this kind of motivates uh, this two-step uh, pseudo-maximum likelihood approach. So you first go out and estimate the conditional choice probabilities, and let's just denote those p hat, okay? Given the uh, directly from the observed data, so that's basically uh, you know con the conditional choice probabilities in each state um, for for all the observable uh, uh, all, all the all the the actions, and you can estimate that like with a flexible logit or uh, some non-parametric estimator, or like a fre or frequency estimator, if you have a finite choices, there's many many ways, but you can some non-parametric estimate of that p. Now, then in the second step, well, you could just put those p's in and and try to see if you can um, solve the impact. But now you have one less uh, variable to to uh, worry about on the right hand side here. Or equivalently, you can substitute this guy here. Um, um, you can substitute away uh, 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 this guy here uh, by substituting this into the likelihood function. So now it depends on the structural parameters, right? Uh, and then you get this problem here subject to this additional constraint. It's not really quite what we want, right? Because we would be really cool if we would not have to do the uh, constraint, any constraint optimization here, imposing that uh, those Bellman equations as, as constraints. Uh, but if we could just go out and estimate and then do the Hasmuller. And actually that can be done. So let's let's do the a reformulation of the optimization step in step two. Um, so, so here, um, a reformulation of that problem uh, so that we can express base, basically the uh, the Bellman equation and the Bayesian Nash equilibrium equations in in one uh, in one e equation um, that gives a so say the best response mapping from choice probabilities to choice probabilities, just like we express the, the Bellman equation in choice probability space for single agent models when we talked about the NPL um, estimator by Akira Mira two thousand and two. Um, okay, so we recall Bellman optimality, and then we can you know write all this stuff in matrix notation here. So basically, v uh, the bold v that's just a collection of value functions for all the uh, for, uh, vi for, for, for the collection of value functions all across all states for player i, and then we, we again we stack uh, p hat i for the estimated choice probabilities for all across all the states here e p again uh, stacked across all the states and and uh, and and again the same for the expected payoffs and then for the transition matrix for the observable states. 
Okay, so this is that's a little bit of you know notation here, but it's it's not you know crazy once you try to sit down and program it. You, you see this 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 coming right at you. Okay, and then if you do that, then the Bellman equation can be written in this matrix form, um, um, and then you can basically um, uh, you see everything that that's going on over here, right? Um, that can be moved to the other side. So you got basically. Uh, now V here uh, on the left hand side uh, times I uh, the, the, the I did the matrix here for, for this term but then also minus beta uh, the con times the control transition matrix for the state variables which is really this part here that you subtract to the other side so then you got this um, on the left hand side and then you got the choice probability weighted sum of the expected payoffs and the uh, expected uh, um, uh, the condition or the conditional expectation of the epsilons. Okay, so so <clears throat> or equivalently, you can solve for v. Okay, and then you get something similar to what we talked about previously. The the value, um, um, uh, the policy valuation operator, which gives us gives us the mapping from choice probabilities to value functions. See, everything here depends on the choice probabilities. Here, the choice probabilities for all the players, those conditional expectations. Um, of the epsilons, well, that's indexed by the choice choice probabilities. Um, in, in particular, if you got the epsilon, I the extreme value shocks, then you got those those. Uh, where would we have those? We got those here, just being the Euler's constant minus uh, sigma times log of the probability um, um, for, for for that alternative. Um, so that that essentially just depends on on choice probabilities. Um, so you got choice probabilities, choice probabilities, choice probabilities here, and everything here in, inside here, the expected payoffs, well, that could just be computed from the uh, specification of the model. So everything here, well, we also get the controlled transition process given the be beliefs about your, your your future choice, your own future choice, and, and the, the other players' uh, optimal decisions. So once you know that vector of P, you can calculate the values. Okay, so this means that you can go out and estimate those as uh, those choice probabilities and then you can calculate the implied value functions if you uh, know what the structure parameters and those p's are and that's really uh, a key trick to all the two-step estimators or for the two-step estimators relying on that is that you completely circumvent um, solving the model because you can invert uh, the the, uh, the 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 problem this way Okay, so, so here to, to complete this reformulation of the optimal problem, uh, where do we have that? Here in step, in step two, the, the, this problem. Now we've, we've reformulated this problem um, uh, to the, the following problem. Okay, so now we got the value, the, the, the constraints um, here that, that depend on both the values and choice probabilities. Now we can we can simply remove the dependence on these through uh, a simple elimination um, um, using using this policy valuation operator that we just developed here on this slide uh, that you can just you know substitute in into this guy here and then everything uh, inside the likelihood function uh, suddenly only depends on the choice probabilities that we have gone out and estimated and then the structural parameters. Okay, so now there's no constraints anymore, and uh, there's no requirements to solve the bell, to, to solve the model in any way. It's just the static uh, discrete choice problem. Once you condition on uh, what uh, what the um, choice probabilities are, and so if you got conditional, uh, so if you got consistent estimates of those p's, well then you can consist it you can consistently estimate. Uh, theta using this pseudo maximum likelihood estimator, uh, which is you know the argument that maximizes the selection function. So that's extremely popular, and you can see why, right? Because there's nothing about multiplicity of equilibria. There's nothing about resolving all for all the macro perfect equilibria. It's just solving. It's just it's, it's essentially going out estimating some some you know, conditional choice probabilities. Estimating some transition matrices for the state variables um, in the first step, um, and then doing the Hotz-Miller inversion for games. You know, doing this uh, um, um, inversion here, 
and and then put everything together and do a two step a single um, do a, a, a maximization of a low likelihood function which take this this very very simple form um, where where would you have it here uh, where those uh, choice problems here are so to say uh, the uh, um, the 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 best response mapping uh, conditional on the estimated best responses. This best response mapping here, where this is substituted into it for v here, so you got a best a mapping from choice problems to choice problems. Okay, so now so the issue here is the potential. If you this is a big object, so you go out. You really need to estimate this choice problem is for all the different states, for all the different players, okay, for all the different choices. And so you have limited amounts of data. So if you want to estimate that non-parametrically, you got a curse dimensionality and, and that curse that gives imprecise estimates of the choice problems, which spills over in terms of giving potential large biases of the structural parameters, like finite sample bias. Okay, so maybe we can improve on that. That's what uh, the whole purpose of the NPL estimator is, to bridge a gap between the highly complex computational complex maximum likelihood estimator and the two-step estimators that are simple but uh, have finite sample biases. Okay, so in, in order, to, in effort to, to reduce the finite sample biases associated with the two-stage uh, approaches, like the two-step uh, pseudo-maximum likelihood estimator, and other two-step approaches. Again, Kibiri and Mira, they propose to extend the NPL operator, which would be, um, um, which would be um, a, a fixed point on the NPL mapping. Okay, and the NPL mapping is a mapping that satisfies the following set of conditions, so that the choice probability. The, where the choice probability satisfies the best response mapping, where you have basically taken the Bayesian Nash equilibrium equations and substituted in the policy valuation operators, again, choice probability mapping from choice probabilities to choice probabilities, very clever, okay? And then, um, and at the same time, maximizes the pseudo likelihood using the, this, um, um, uh, yeah, using the, uh, uh, best response uh, mapping indexed by the structural parameters theta. So, uh, what the NPL algorithm does is that instead of just using, uh, just um, doing that maximization once, okay, or evaluating that mapping once, it does a six, it does if try to find a fixed point on that by using successive approximations. And this is what we will show is potentially unstable, trying to find the fixed point on the NPL mapping using successive approximations. I mean, we saw last time that it actually diverged even for the simple, simple static game. Okay? And that's the case for dynamic games as well. If they're unstable, uh, or if they're potentially multiple equilibrium and, and, and that mapping is unstable. But nobody says you need to use the successive approximation uh, algorithm, and like like uh, Agirre-Gabiria and Mira proposed to begin with. Actually, Victor Agirre-Gabiria uh, is is working now on on trying to find the fixed point using other methods, um, so-called spectral algorithm, uh, which is kind of a Newton type uh, uh, method. Uh, so, 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 so and, and that has better properties because it doesn't rely on this mapping being a contraction mapping, which it's not if there's multiple equilibria. Anyway, so this is the NPL operator. The principles are the same. It's just that now the, the mapping from choice probabilities to choice probabilities is a little bit bigger because we have more players. If we have players, uh, several players, and not only like a vector of choice probabilities, conditional choice probabilities for, for one particular player. Okay, now, uh, um, Passendorfer and Smith Dingler, they uh, they show that they had a comment to that paper by Gabriel Muir and showing that there was you know some problems with lack of convergence and, and so on. Okay, and then uh, Kasahara and Shimatsu they suggest a modified NPL algorithm, um, so um, that that was uh, supposed to like uh, make the NPL mapping or more stable or dampen uh, it, if if it, if uh, if it, if it was you know unstable enough, you can me measure instability or how stable or, or, or 
how much uh, close it, 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 the, this mapping is to a contraction mapping by measuring something called the spectral radius. And in here, you, you basically take the largest eigenvalue of the derivative of the mapping you're looking at. Okay, In this case, the best response map. Um, and um, and then or, or the NPL mapping because we are, we are maximizing that with respect to the parameters in the in the inner loop. Okay. Um, that uh, so if 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 you have something uh, that is like vertical, you know, smaller than one, so um, then you have a, you have a, a contraction and. And uh, uh, let's see here. And then uh, uh, anyway, I'm kind of blanking on it right now. The, 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 you know, the, depending on the contraction properties of this NPL mapping, then uh, uh, you can you can dampen the. Um, um, uh, the the, the uh, success approximation algorithm and and then in, instead of of using the, uh, the this this second step as is well then you make, take this uh, uh, geometric average of of the uh, of the usual step here and then uh, basically where, where you are to kind of slow down if you're jumping too far and then with lambda e equal to one, then this boils down to the original uh, NPL uh, um, operator. Okay, and then uh, so this is this is kind of like a tuning parameter. But then Kesahara and Shimatsu they suggest using the spectral radius, which is like the uh, uh, largest eigenvalue of the derivative of that of that mapping, with respect to the choice probabilities. Anyway, so back to Gide Gabiri and Mira, the, the example. Okay, so now we want to try to see if we can estimate this model. Okay, um, and and here is the um, and here it is. Okay, so we got discrete time, infinite horizon, and we got the end players. Everything is like just like we said in the beginning. We have uh, a common state, uh, uh, common knowledge state variable is the market size, and and here we consider an example uh, that we're using for Monte Carlo, where where s is one up to to five, sometimes we look at, at 10, sometimes we look at, at bigger problems with 15. And so, so, so this uh, uh, number of, uh, of market sizes is going to vary. Uh, but if there is five, then the total number of grid points in the state space would be like the number of, uh, of our market sizes, which is five times the number of combinations of choices for all the different players, which is going to be two to the power of, of the number of players or to the power of five. So now you get like 160 combinations of, of, of states. Re remember, you know, it's it, because we, we got two state variables. We both got the market size, but also got uh, the vector of, um, of, of, of the um, states um, for all uh, of the lack uh, activity or the lack A's for, for all the different players. Okay, so that's what's in here. Then you got the discount factor and the scale parameter. We, we put those uh, to 0 0.95 and, and, and sigma um, uh, is equal to one for the scale parameter i extreme value distribution. And then we got the same utility function as, as we just outlined before. And we want to try to see if we can estimate this uh, parameters rs that index how the revenue depends on the market size. And then theta rn, how, uh, which is kind of measuring the um, um, which is, is measuring the strategic uh, uh, incentives implied by uh, other firms entering into the market. So this is the number of players active in the market. Uh, so really the sum of all the, the actions um, for all the other players. So, so this is what makes it a game. And, and then you got the uh, minus a fixed cost for being active in the market or and, and minus entry cost if you were active in the market this period, but not in the last period. Okay. And then we want to try to see if we can estimate all those structural parameters, the um, um, the, the revenue parameter um, um, as a function of market size, the and how it depends on the number of players, uh, the fixed cost and the entry cost. Okay, and then this this guy here is actually uh, a vector of 
of tr uh, of firm specific uh, fixed effects of, in terms of entry costs. A bit, uh, of, in terms of fixed costs, so each firm had potentially different fixed costs, which is a little bit of an academic exercise because you, you you don't know what the potential firms that are there is. So how do you actually calculate those uh, uh, firm specific fixed costs um, uh, and, and 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 assign them to each uh, each firm? Um, that's 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 a that's a that's a question I haven't thought much about, but <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, so. Um, I think maybe it's it's more easy to think of those being if you are thinking of them as being market specific as Akira Kabiri and Mura is actually doing their paper uh, because you know markets are something that is actually really fixed um, and and now um, yeah yeah anyway so um, so so here's here's some descriptive evidence from the Kiri Kabiri and Mura you got 187 uh, Geographically separated markets um, uh, uh, over a period of time from 1994 to 1999, um, giving um, how many observations? Uh, 945. Okay, so um, so that's it. That's it. That's a data. Okay, so you see here this five different industries. We're looking at restaurants, gas stations, bookstores, shoe shops, and fish shops, and and by you know, a huge margin. You can see this. Just m many more restaurants per um, per per uh, per person in the population, or, or per per people, than there are gas stations and, and and any other shops. Okay, so this is like there's lots of restaurants. Okay, and then you can also see that the market concentration. Um, is much higher for for gas stations. I mean, here measured by the Herfindel index, and and there's many more markets where there's this essentially fewer firms. Okay. Um, so um, in 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 another thing to note here is that the survival rate is uh, pretty low for restaurants. Okay, after like um, three years, forty percent are gone. Whereas for uh, gas stations, they stick around longer. Okay, so once you're in, you kind of get to stay there. Okay, um, uh, and and most of the exit actually happens, uh, you know, right after the entry, right after one year. Um, so so but but and and this this uh, uh, high amount of turnover is common to to many of these uh, other industries, but not to to gas stations. Okay, so. So these are potentially very different industries, and we can expect to have different uh, parameter estimates of the, uh, the of the parameters of interest. Okay, so, so here's some you know some of the observations is why is it, why so many restaurants and so few gas stations and bookstores? Okay, uh, why is it you know the the market concentration is smaller in the restaurant industry? Why is that the case? Okay, and turnover rates are very high in all industries. Okay. Uh, but uh, but the survival is much more likely uh, for gas station than for other industries. So, so what is explaining these facts and, and if you view, view these observables through the lens of the model? So that's econo economies of scale. Like, you know, if the fixed costs are high, that's going to be big economies of scale, right? So you may want to, it may be that we would expect to find smaller fixed costs for restaurants. Right? And it may, makes sense if you compare to a gas station where you uh, you you need to have um, um, you need to you, you you really need I mean it's not like you can make a, a, a you know a, a gas station overnight and just you know find some boots and pan and pots and pans and and some tables serve some food you know you need to big dig a big hole in the ground and put in big tanks and have chemicals and this is this is complicated right so. Um, uh, so you may want to. Th it, it may be that there is some highly industry-specific fixed uh, sunken entry cost for for restaurants that uh, um, uh, that are much higher for gas station than for restaurants. And then the strategic interaction here at play, right? That may be very different across the different types of markets. So, and think about strategic interaction here. It's measured in terms of uh, the ability to do product differentiation. If this um, uh, is that possible for gas stations? Well, you know, different gas stations can have different types of candy or different types of ice cream and, and different types of goods and sausages and stuff, okay? 
But but really, the main the main thing they sell is gasoline, and they are just completely homogeneous goods. So the room for product differentiation is just much much smaller for gas stations compared to restaurants where you can, you know a chef can have a special recipe. There's not really a special recipe for gasoline, right? It's octane eighty five or X, octane uh, ninety three or whatever, you know, they are diesel or gasoline, right? So so it's not like the you, you go to the, this um, you know this connoisseur of gasoline gas stations and find the optimal level uh, of octane or for your engine. Okay, there are a little bit of product differentiation across space, but here since the the markets are separated geographically, it's kind of uh, fair to say that those um, gas stations have less product differentiations compared to. Restaurants and and book stores like you know be academic bookstores that sells uh, you know books about Bellman equations and then there'll be bookstores that sells like Nick Carter uh, crappy paperbacks about some stupid um, um, you know uh, uh, crime that's trying to be resolved. Okay, anyway. So okay, so here's the structural parameters. Okay, and and, and what you really see here is. That if you take look at the if you look at the operating uh, the fixed cost the fixed operating cost is is huge and is statistically significant for all the different industries and like we expected the gas station parameter here uh, or the fixed operating cost is is much higher for gas stations compared to uh, any other industries or for 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 um, for uh, um, at least uh, compared to restaurants, okay. And the entry cost is also higher uh, and co higher compared to any other um, um, industries, okay. So it's just it's 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 very costly to be in the market owning a gas station and and just running it, okay. So you need to have some um, some have some profits, okay. So. Um, yeah, so so these are these are these are significant fractions of the um, of of the actual revenue. Okay, so here we calculated the ratio between the fixed cost and variable cost profits um, um, of a monopolist um, uh, in a market of median size. Okay, okay, so 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 here we we work with the. Uh, um, work with that okay so you see here that the fixed cost again normalized relative to to uh, the profits of a monopolist is um, is 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 basically uh, smaller for, for for restaurants compared to gas stations okay so and and you got lower uh, entry cost uh, um, for restaurants compared to gas stations also for bookstores by the way uh, lower entry cost um, and then you got this. What is measuring here? This strategic uh, interaction with the other players is: what is the person reduction in variable profits per firm when you go from a monopoly to a duopoly? I mean, you can verify that by by looking at what the uh, per period payoffs, uh, how that depends on uh, on the number of players here. You know, so you 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 put in uh, you know. This being either one or, 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 or two, if you're in monopoly or in in, um, in duopoly, that that explains a lot too here when you take that difference. Okay, um, and then log one that would just you know uh, be zero, so that disappears. Okay, so um, anyway, so so that measure that strategic uh, that that measure on strategic strategic interaction is you know the reduction variable profits per firm. Um, when you go from monopoly to duopoly at median market size is is again is uh, bigger for 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 gas stations Potent, presumably because of the homogeneity of the good uh, and that makes it less room for for um, product differentiation in, in, um, so 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 that's uh, that's kind of in, intuitive okay um, so here's uh, yeah. So here's essentially some comments. You know, fixed fixed operating cost very important component of, of total profits. Like we see here, it's a it's a big share. Uh, entry cost is statistically significant in all the in different industries. Like we like we also uh, 
uh, sort here. They, they're in, in, significant. And then the strategic interaction is, is also important for all the different industries with some variation. And, and most notably, uh, you got uh, a bigger reduction in, um, in, in, in profits when going from monopoly to duopoly if you are in a, in a market for gas stations. Okay, so I mean, these are some of the findings. Uh, summary of the findings of Gitta Mira. It's very, you know, in interesting application of analysis uh, analysis of uh, of how the competition works at, at different uh, at several different industries in the Chilean uh, retail market. Um, uh, so I think I pretty much sa said all this. Um, so I'm not going to repeat it. Okay, so let's do a little bit of Monte Carlo. So so now going back to thinking about the properties of the different estimators and uh, that could be used to estimate this model. And by the way, all these parameter estimates, they are obtained by using the NPL, uh, the NPL um, estimator by Gitta-Gabiri and Muir. Um, but we could use other methods. So uh, rather than, than trying to figure out how the computation time would change for that particular one saying, we're going to do a Monte Carlo and see how are the properties of those estimators are, both in terms of the statistical properties, but also in terms of their uh, conversions and computer time. So we're going to work with the transition matrix here, uh, which is like block diagonal. Um, and so market size can stay where it is, um, or it can, it can increase. Um, so if it's in the bottom, well, it can't decrease any further, but it, but if you're a market size, or say the second market size, it can go down or it can stay put with probably six, with 60% probability, or it can move up once. Okay. But it can't like move up uh, more than one. Okay. So this uh, transition matrix is, is sparse. Okay. So this is uh, the, uh, the transition matrix for the state variables. Now, when the market size then takes on these, uh, uh, then takes on these different values, uh, you know, that could then depending on what what the number of uh, uh, of values there are that S can take, then this matrix will be bigger or small. And we're actually going to vary uh, the number of of uh, uh, columns and rows and columns in this matrix, or, or the number of values that S can take. Um, in the Monte Carlo, we're going to consider. Actually, we're going to vary it uh, in uh, look at two cases, case three and five in the paper by East and Lian Su, uh, with uh, with with uh, five, like in um, in in the Agilgebiri and Mira Monte Carlo experiment, or and we're going to increase it to five. And this is actually this is a typo. Sorry about that. This is fifteen. Okay, so so five five and then. Uh, 10 and 15. Okay, so so, so these are the, um, uh, the the three different cases we consider. So we're going to keep all this the remaining structure parameters, the fixed cost being this vector here for all the different uh, the five different firms. So there's going to be one with high, very high fixed cost and a little gradually lower and lower and lower, and then one with a lower fixed cost. And then the entry cost is going to be one for all firms. <clears throat> and then we're going to vary. Um, theta rs and rn and then the number of or uh, uh, of the, the number of grid points in the market size spectrum okay so our case um, three which corresponds to the experiment of Gibberia and Mira we have um, rs um, uh, two, two and rn to one okay so rn that that's really the that's how revenue depends on the number of players, and this is how it depends on the market size. Okay, so these are two and one. So then we we double those coefficients, and actually that makes the the um, uh, and given that we are holding fixed the variance of the epsilon shocks, this makes these parameters more important, and actually makes the strategic room for investment relatively more important compared to the ID extreme value shocks, and potentially this could create. Uh, a, a, uh, multiplicity of equilibrium, okay, um, um, and then um, in order to look at cases where we have um, um, uh, more computational complexity, well, then we increase, uh, we take the K three and increase S to ten, and 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 take ten values and then fifteen values. If had you know, th this is 
this is what's going on in, in, in case six. Okay, I'm sorry for the typo. Anyway, so let's talk first about a little bit about the number of the constraints and variables in, in the MPEG formulation. So the MPEG formulation can actually be implemented in s several different ways. I mean, nobody says that the constraints should be have to be formulated like this. But if you do it, I mean, you could also have used the policy, uh, the, the the mapping from choice probabilities to choice probabilities by using the Im implementing the hot similar inversion if that's uh, when that's since that's feasible. Um, and then you would only have one set of constraints, the mapping from choice probabilities to choice probabilities. Okay, but but right now we're just working with these with the um, the Bayesian Nash equilibrium uh, with the Bellman equations and and the Bayesian Nash equilibrium con constraints uh, um, that that ha you know from this very first formulation that we had. Uh, where do we have them here? Here, these two here. Okay, so we worked with those raw. And so let's let's go back. So these two constraints, well, there's going to be a choice specific value function. Uh, not there's going to be a value function for each state and each player. There's going to be two choice probabilities, uh, uh, you know, being active and not active, um, uh, for 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 each player and for each state. Okay. So that gives like three different types of constraints. I think if it's formulating, it's, it, they're using a slightly different formulation in 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 A state line. Soon they're they're working with one with one of the choice probabilities uh, for for being active, and then the impose a constraint that that the choice probabilities have to sum up to one. So you know you can get the last one where one minus the probabilities. Okay, so. <clears throat> So that gives in total three, in this case, three constraints for each state and for each player. Okay, and if there were like cell, it, so so this three would if there's would that would be bigger if there's like ten different choices. Well, then there would not be, uh, you know, one plus plus two. It would be one plus ten. So that would be eleven. Okay, and then that has to be multiplied with the number of states and the number of players to calculate, you know, the number essentially the number of constraints. And so the three different cases have different. Um, Oh, that yeah, have different um, um, numbers of uh, uh, of constraints. So when you have uh, K three and five, with this uh, number uh, number of states are, are are equal to to five, well then you have twenty four hundred. Okay. Then in the in the five and six, where we increase uh, the number of um, uh, grid points for for market size. To, to to ten and fifteen, we get forty eight hundred and and seventy two hundred. Now these are the number of constraints, and then the number of variables. Well, the variables essentially just v and p, and and then the structural parameters. So so uh, and then the, there's going to be as many. So then there's going to be as as many uh, constraints as variables, uh, uh, but plus the additional. Um, uh, uh, parameters that you're also solving for, right? Because that's that's part of the uh, constraint optimization problem. Let's see if we can find it here. Yeah. So, so now this is for the two steps. So let's uh, find the. Yeah, here it is, right? So this is this additional set of parameters, and then these two two constraints. Okay. So so that's that's the number. That's how the dimensionality look. Okay. So 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 now if you just think about. What is you know when you're solving constraint optimization problems, you need to find the Jacobian of the constraints, and to find the Jacobian of the constraints, you need to differentiate all these different you know seventy two hundred constraints with respect to seventy two hundred and eight plus for the eight uh, uh, structural parameters, um, so that gives a uh, uh, seventy two hundred by um, seventy two hundred and eight. Um, uh, matrix of uh, Jacobi uh, dimensional matrix of, uh, of the Jacobian of the constraints because you know you're differentiating uh, all these 7200 constraints with respect to this 7208 parameters. Okay, now that gives 51 million or almost 52 million different combinations, which is you know even for this. I would go as far as say this is a very small problem. This one common state variable, uh, and then there's like you know there's there's five different players, and um, you know there's there's only these uh, two 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 simple state variables. So it's not like it's like a, a humongous problem. But just look at 
with with this uh, relatively few constraints and uh, few variables, you got so many different uh, combinations, right? Um, but then here, it's really essential to utilize sparsity because only it turns out that only one uh, one point zero eight percent of them are non-zero. Um, so sp sparsity here is really really key. Otherwise, you would need to to calculate and store that huge matrix, okay? And it and and, and as a, and actually as the size of the problem grows, the 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 fraction of elements where you have non that are non-zero actually also decreases. So it's not like that's that's kind of ameliorating the, that curse of dimensionality a little bit. But still, you know, this is uh, half a million uh, non-zero elements, uh, but um, for for the small problem, and and it's due to this this sparsity here. So if if this if it was actually possible to you know jump more than one step ahead uh, per, per period, uh, if market size could grow more than I mean if there could be drastic changes, or if this was fully sparse, uh, the, you know this was fully dense this matrix. So you know market size could go anywhere. You know like you could have a corona crisis, and then so, suddenly everybody is indoor. If that can happen with some probability, well, uh, you know then there's going to be um, uh, that's 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 going to be a non-zero probability down here, and and there's no savings in terms of the sparsity. But if you have sparsity, you should definitely use it if you if you're doing MPEG. Okay, so so and in and in the paper by Einstein and Lyon Sue, there's a nice table that shows how that uh, size of the uh, Jacobian constraints how that varies with the with with various different settings of uh, you know the number of, of of states and number of players and and, and so on. Um, okay, so a little bit more <laughs> implementation details now for the different types of estimators. For the case, uh, we, so we're gonna in each data set we can use five hundred markets and and ten observations in each market. For each of the case three and four, so that is with the relatively small market size, you know, market size of five. Um, where is it? Yeah, here s uh, number of s is equal to five. Um, we simulate 100 Monte Carlo data sets and um, we use a 10 starting points for each data set. Okay, so this, um, this MPEG really relies on starting values and we need to try to see if we can search over the, the entire surface of the, the likelihood function and make sure we do not jump into the, or fall into those, um, uh, into those local minima and stay there. So that's why we started by at, at, at several different starting values and then take the maximum out of the 10 tries, okay? This is really, you know, uh, and maybe a little bit, uh, you know, hard to explore if there's like uh, lots and lots of minima. It's not a guarantee that you will find the global maximum to do a multi starts, okay? And then for, for the slightly bigger problem, we use fewer data sets and, and fewer starting points because it takes time, okay? So that's for NPEG. For NPL, well, uh, in NPL lambda, we, the, we put an upper bound of the number of, of successive approximations because if it's not converged by k equal to 100, well, it's not going to converge. Uh, and most likely it's going to die because it's diverging or it because there's some instable equilibrium where, where you can like, uh, where it's like a dog chasing its take and tail and it's like making circles. Um, for for the NPL lambda algorithm, lambda was just equal to to 0.5. Okay. Now this could be op more optimally chosen, but this is what we have. Okay, so if you do that, and then um, uh, you get the following results. First, here is the the convergence properties of this. Okay, uh, so the per per percentage of data sets where you actually found a solution, or where, where you find where you found uh, where where the algorithm converged. Okay. So we compare here MLE, which is means MPEG in this case, not an NFXP, the two-stage pseudo-maximum likelihood estimator, the NPL, and the NPL lambda, which is you know, supposed to be a little bit more stable. Now, in each of these cases, the MLE and the two-step estimators converged 100% of the times. Okay. Now, that's not, it's not surprising that the two-stage MLE uh, the two states uh, pseudo maximum likelihood is converging because you're going out and estimating all those CCPs um, non parametrically, and then it's all about maximizing uh, uh, the likelihood function of a, 
uh, a static low chip model, which has a globally concave likelihood function. So if you can maximize that, well, then you need to do a little bit of, you know, you need to do a little bit of debugging because that's just the easiest thing to find a maximum of. Okay, it's, it's just guaranteed to converge if you use any sensible algorithm like Newton Rapson or BHHH or whatever you, you, you find suitable for, for maximizing that pseudo likelihood. Now it's a little bit more, you know, it's 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 very uh, nice to see that the MPAC MLEs is actually converging in 100% of these uh, uh, cases across the different uh, uh, three different experiments we're considering here. Now there's also one and two experiments, one and two and other experiments in the paper, but 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 three, four, and five those we are discussing here, it converges 100% of the times. Whereas in PL Lambda, we start to see uh, problems of convergence uh, with, uh, in the case of Agini Gabiria and Muir, it, um, that they considered with that set of parameters, uh, Ace and Lyle Sue had some uh, uh, issues with convergence. I think maybe they are uh, using other starting values because the, um, it's the same set of parameters as as I get a had, so so they were, um, and in their in their paper they they had they show better convergence properties, but but you know here it's 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 pretty low, okay. So and then it turns out if you change those uh, parameters, um, um, and and the NPL lambda, well that's is 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 able to. To solve that entirely, so it's about some something about the uh, instability of or, or it, 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 this um, Bellman operator, or, or no, no, not Bellman, the, the Bellman operator in in the choice probability space uh, with um, or the NPL mapping um, not being a a contraction or being unstable, and then the NPL lambda cannot alleviate that. But then once you make the um, uh, the structural parameters bigger relative to the uh, ID extreme value shocks, and this, the, in particular, the game becomes more contestable. Even the NPL lambda is not able to converge anymore. Okay, and the NPL is 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 actually never really converging. Okay, whereas it seems that the MLE and two step estimators are doing a pretty good job here. Okay, and then for for it doesn't get better by increasing the size of the state space. But it converges uh, for for the for the MLE. Now let's look at the computer time. Okay. Now of course, in for cases five and six where you have much bigger state space, right? So here we got seventy two hundred uh, constraints, uh, and then here we got twenty four hundred constraints, right? So of course it's going to take more longer time. Um, or, or actually, this is MLE. This is computer time for MLE. It's going to take longer time as you increase the state space from. Uh, the, the the size of the state space from twenty four hundred to twenty forty eight hundred to uh, seventy two hundred or a number of uh, a number of uh, market sizes being five uh, ten and fifteen okay so it increases here and it it increases more than linearly okay um, but not uh, well it's hard to see if it's exponential from here but it's definitely increasing more than linearly. Which kind of uh, makes sense because this, the say the Jacobian of the constraints. Well, that's uh, a quadratic. Uh, that's uh, uh, quadratic in the number of states. Right? Uh, okay, so the two-step estimators. Well, they are clearly the fastest ones. So these are the red crosses in the beginning, right? Because it's so easy. Okay? So why are we not just using those all the time? And what the the, the NPL. Uh, is is spending more and more time uh, for 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 bigger uh, for bigger problems, um, presumably because it's uh, tr spending time on trying to find a solution that is impossible to find, uh, or really hard to find. Um, so maybe not the ideal algorithm, but 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 uh, uh, in this case, at least not when you're trying to find the. the Fixed point of the MPL mapping using successive approximations in games where the that are very unstable, but as as mentioned, uh, Agni Gabiria uh, Mira is 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 working on on actually improving that and show some promising results. Anyway, so why don't we not just use the the two-step estimators? Well, this is because if you look at the two-step estimators here, 
um, uh, then you get uh, potentially biased uh, parameter estimates, and particularly the the uh, parameter estimates that depends on um, uh, here um, for the the strategic the, the one that indexes strategic interaction. Well, that should be two, right? This is the true value here. You've got the true value of, of the, the one that controls the revenue. Uh, so it's a function of market size, and and say they are, they are actually quite downward biased. Two to 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 point eight and and one to point is around point uh, point seven. Okay, so it's so, you know substantial bias, uh, and this was in case three. Okay, uh, case four it doesn't get much better. Um, uh, <laughs> if anything, it gets it's worse. So you you get you get a huge uh, biases in these cases, uh, basically because the parameters are, are the because even though it's consistent with the conditional choice probabilities being non, be, they are consistently estimated, and we could potentially do so. And I, uh, since they identified from the those data, and instead of just using frequency estimators, they are high-dimensional objects and potentially subject to finite sample bias. So uh, that finite sample bias is going to be transmitted into the second-step structural parameters. Okay. Which is very unfortunate, uh, in you know, uh, downside of it. At least it's kind of capturing the um, the uh, the right sign, but but it's not at all perfect. The NPL algorithm, well, that that didn't uh, converge uh, in this case, so we don't have any good estimates here. Um, it 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 does it it does improve when it converges. Um, in this case, um, so so the NPL um, estimator is is improving. Relative to the um, uh, to the two-step estimators, and it looks more and more like the the maximum likelihood estimates. But you know the the problem is that it's not always converging. And 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 here in this case where the structure parameter is now a four and two, here so so these are increases much more room for uh, for strate strategic room for interaction between the players. Then it's not even converging. Because potentially because of instability of the map, then you got case. Uh, um, so this this was case three and four. This is case uh, five and six. And uh, again, you got problems with. Uh, um, uh, you got you got problems now with the uh, two step um, um, finite sample bias, and and actually here this problem is growing right because now you have. When when the problem here is becoming a higher dimensional, well, there's also more. Um, you also have to go out and estimate those uh, transition density, um, uh, which is a higher higher dense uh, higher uh, object and the higher dimensional object and the choice probabilities are also higher dimensional, right? So now you're really slicing the same amount of data more, and you get more fine uh, finite sample bias uh, as the size of the problem increase. Whereas the uh, MLE doesn't really care um, the um, how how the um, uh, state space uh, is divided, how that variation is discretized. If anything, it actually becomes more efficient. Um, so yeah. Anyway, so this is um, uh, this is these are the results from the um, the Monte Carlo in East Day Alliance suit. So, so you know, sheds lights and some some comparative advantages for, for these different methods. So here's a conclusion for for the ESN line. So it's basically recursively uh, recursive methods like the NPL and the NPL lambda um, algorithms are not always reliable computational algorithms, and they should be used in, with, with 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 caution. At least if you're trying to to find the fixed point on, on the uh, on those on the NPL mapping using successive approximations. Um, uh, and like I said, you can find that fixed point in other ways, but it doesn't really solve the problems with multiple equilibria because finding a fixed point, how can you know that you're actually finding the fixed point that is consistent with the equilibrium that was actually played in the data? Now, the two-step estimators is really, you know, nailing that. It, it's selecting the right equilibrium if you have enough data. But the problem is, um, 
that it produces high uh, produces large finite sample biases. This is not surprising, and you know this is actually due to to uh, work by by Errol Pekas, Ostrich, and Steve Berry, um, uh, where they're comparing all these different two step estimators. You know, the very nice paper to look at. Um, and then the question is, if the two step estimators or the sequential estimators can uh, or other estimators can perform better. Um, and, and, and actually, in Gideon, Gabiria, and Mira, they are not, they are using in the first step, a, they are comparing a frequency estimator of this two, uh, of this, uh, of the, uh, um, frequency estimator um, uh, of, of the uh, conditional choice probabilities with a flexible low jet um, uh, that avoids some of the problems with potentially having uh, 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 so it's like smoothing out some cells that are nearby, um, and 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 shows that 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 actually gives a little bit better uh, uh, probability uh, probabilities of the two step estimators when you use uh, depending on what the first step estimate you're using. Anyway, so the constraint optimization approach seems reliable here and capable of estimating dynamic games uh, such as the one, the ones in Kirikabiri and Mira. However, you really have still the problem with uh, uh, increasing computational complexity. So even when utilizing sparsity, even when doing, uh, as, as is done here in their implementation, when, when doing uh, automatic uh, differentiation uh, um, of both first and second order derivatives of the Hessian and, and, the, and the constraints, um, and then it, it's it's still uh, you know a, a computational challenging problem. So if you have uh, uh, more state variables uh, uh, than uh, um, like you know seven, it's not you know unrealistic to have more than seventy two hundred combinations. Then it's it's really really a killer. We're gonna look at next time a model where there's three state variables. Um, three, that that all potential continues. So if you discretize them into ten different values, well, then you have you know ten by ten by ten, right? So that's that's already a thousand for for all the different players, for all the different uh, combinations. So you, then you you you, you, you that, that's just with ten. But if you want to solve with you know a finer, then you have an uh, issue. So the improving the uh, performance of the constraint optimization approach on dynamic games. How do you do that with high dimensional state spaces? Um so 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 that's 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 a real concern with 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 MPEG. And um, the question is also, I mean there's a there's a built-in constraint uh, uh, curse of dimensionality in constraint optimization problems as well. So you can't really get rid of that. Um, of course you can ameliorate it by using sparsity and so on. Is MPEG really reliable? as reliable as a nested fixed point algorithm if we had like a sure fire way to find all the marker perfect equilibria when there's a huge multiplicity of equilibria i mean so imagine a world where you you could find like that's like a billion equilibria but you have an algorithm that just finds all of them and then you can just enumerate um, all the equilibria calculate the likelihood function across all those different equilibria and then just take the maximum of all of them okay if that equilibrium finds then the question is can an impact really deal with that and we're going to discuss uh, that potential next time. Okay, and um, so the, the benefit of uh, of MPEG is that it's not relying on a full solution algorithm for for finding all mark perfect equilibria, uh, but NFXP does that. It needs an algorithm. So we're going to investigate that in the next lecture for a specific class of games, namely directional dynamic games, games where the state space only moves in one direction. So an example of a, uh, uh, a, 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 a directional state, well, that would be if the market is only growing. So, so then this, this state transition matrix would be upper tri triangle, or if it's only falling, then it would be lower triangle. Okay. Those schemes are more simple, and we're going to look at those next time. Um, and we have an algorithm for finding all market perfect equilibria um, uh, for that. Anyway, so that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much for your patience.